Some stars of sport and screen are so popular they become known just by their first name. Orenthal James Simpson became known by just two letters, OJ. Hey, x well it's me, yours truly. Boy, what a beautiful day it is here in Las Vegas. Even though the game is indoors, it wouldn't have mattered, but still, it's nice to have a beautiful day like this. First a hugely successful star of American football, he parlayed his popularity into a second career in film and television. He was charming, good looking, from relatively humble beginnings, a black American who became the poster boy of the American dream. That dream became a nightmare. In 1994, at a time of huge racial tension in the States, he was arrested, accused and charged with the twin murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ron Goldman. In 1995, despite powerful circumstantial evidence, including him fleeing arrest, he was acquitted in a trial that was watched around the globe. I'm Neil Patterson, and in this edition of the Sky News Daily, we will reflect on the legacy of the man the world once knew only as OJ, after his family announced his death from cancer at the age of 76. James Matthews is Sky's US correspondent, and he joins us now. James, look, of course, we will have plenty of time to discuss the crime, the acquittal, the civil offence, the fines, the other crime, the conviction, the jail term. But let's start at the beginning, because let's not forget, and I, I don't think any of our listeners should forget the fact, O.J. Simpson was an incredibly popular figure, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Indeed, because of his sporting success. I mean, he is very much the rags to Richie's story, a kid who grew up in a poor neighbourhood. He had rickets as a child. His mother made braces for him so that he could walk. I mean, that kid grew into one of the most successful sporting stars that has been produced by the United States, signed by the Buffalo Bills, the NFL team, major league team. And he was one of their major stars, breaking all sorts of sporting records as a running back, a true sporting hero. And because of his profile, success, his charisma, his good looks, he was able, subsequent to his sporting to career to make a smooth transition onto the silver screen. He appeared in acting roles in films like The Towering Inferno, the uh, Naked Gun series. He was also snapped up by advertisers, Hertz and so on. So hugely high profile, hugely successful and very much uh, an American icon who was known uh, around the world before anybody knew about the dark side of O.J. Simpson. And an admission at this point, James, of course, you know, I was in my teenage years in the 90s. I, I remember well watching those Naked Gun films, O.J. Simpson, some, a name that I, I hadn't known before I'd watched Naked Gun in that very, very famous role as uh, the comic relief psychic Nordberg. But, but everything took a, well, certainly not a comic turn, but a very dark and tragic one, didn't it, with what, what came to be known as the crime of the century. Yes, anybody who didn't know O.J. from his sporting success or his appearances in movies, he would have come to their attention because of a very gruesome double murder of somebody very close to him, his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson. There was an evening in Los Angeles where she was found dead. She'd been stabbed in the head, had her throat cut, and beside her, dead, also stabbed to death, was a man by the name of Ron Goldman, her friend. She'd been at a restaurant that particular evening in 1994 and uh, she divorced from O.J. Simpson. Uh, they were found dead. Police phoned O.J. Simpson to say, to inform him that his wife had been found dead. They were surprised initially when he didn't ask whether there was any harm brought to bear on two children who were in the house at the time. He asked the police did they see the murder or did they see the body of Nicole Brown Simpson? Detectives went to the house of Simpson that night. They found his car awkwardly parked. There was blood on the door handle and elsewhere. And that night, the night of the murder, O.J. Simpson had to take a flight to Chicago. His limousine driver said he had four bags with him on the way to the airport, but he only checked in three. Detectives think that the murder kit, the clothes that he wore and the murder weapon were in the fourth bag that he disposed of in a trash can at the airport. And that's what set the detectives in his pursuit. And it all came to a head 
with a car chase. Detectives had said to him, look, you need to surrender yourself. We're going to charge you with double murder. He said, fine, I'll surrender voluntarily. But he did not. What he did was get into a white Ford Bronco, uh, driven by his NFL colleague, and uh, there proceeded to be a police pursuit. OJ wasn't going to hand himself in uh, voluntarily. They were driving along the Los Angeles freeway for several hours. People lined the streets. I mean, this was a popular film and sports star. They were cheering for the juice. Uh, but in the back of the car, he had a gun to his head, according to his colleague who was driving the car. That's what he told police. And it was only when his coach spoke to him on the phone that managed to talk him down and uh, talk him into surrendering himself. In the car, incidentally, they found his passport, $8,000 in cash, and also a fake moustache and beard. So it looked very much like OJ was trying to make a break for it. That footage of the Ford Bronco careering down the highway, the motorways we call it in this country, you know, it has, has been played so many times in, in the years since. But what I also remember of that time, James, is that when this case came to trial, and we'll, we'll talk about the trial in, in some depth, America, particularly the west coast of America, was, was really locked into some of the a period of, of racial instability that, that, that I'm not sure that I, I have seen at any point since. I mean, this was just a couple of years after the Rodney King beating by Los Angeles police officers and subsequent riots, you'll remember. And that was the context to this. There was ongoing police malpractice and what was deemed to be racism in the police force around that period. So to some extent, the area was still, the context was still very much tinderbox LA. O.J. Simpson is interesting. He always used to say or tell friends, uh, I'm not black, I'm O.J. In many ways, he was an individual who transcended race, certainly while he was enjoying success. I mean, he was a huge star in America, welded itself to his success and achievement. He enabled America to escape its racial troubles, I suppose, as long as they celebrated O.J. Simpson. He was an individual who straddled America's parallel lines in terms of its culture and its society. I mean, that did change when he was arrested. He was very much an African-American man in handcuffs and on trial for double murder. That was a central plank of the defence case in court. The question to the jury, how can a black man get a fair trial uh, in this context, legally, culturally, socially, when he's accused of murdering uh, a white person? Tell us about the trial, because, I mean, that itself was, was almost as dramatic as the, the, the events of that day that, that O.J. Simpson was accused of crimes on. And it did, as you say, have all the ingredients. Celebrity, uh, a double murder, gruesome evidence, the, the good, the bad and the ugly of an American sporting and acting icon. So there were all the ingredients uh, for an audience that was coming fresh to uh, trials, courtroom trials, played out live on television. But I remember watching it when I could on a daily basis, certainly at the key moments. Clearly the verdict day, that was huge around the world. But there were moments throughout, you know, key witnesses um, who became celebrities in themselves. The, uh, uh, the detectives who were accused of, of being crooked and of planting evidence, the lawyers themselves defending O.J. Simpson, Kardashian, Johnny Cochran, Alan Dershowitz, people like that. Probably the key moment was the bloody glove. Anyone who watched that trial will remember the famous line, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. It was a moment in which O.J. Simpson tried on a glove, a glove that was found um, at the murder scene. On the night of the murder, there was one glove at the murder scene, one glove found at O.J. Simpson's property. He tried on this glove at the time. The prosecution uh, prompted him to do so. And the glove was a tight fit. It didn't fit. Uh, and he waved his hand to the jury. And Alan Dershowitz, his lawyer, said to O.J. Simpson, who had planned to testify, he said, look, you don't need to testify anymore. You, the case has just turned. And sure enough, uh, that was one of the key moments on which the case turned in that trial. A murder, a key piece of prosecution evidence that didn't fit on O.J. Simpson's 
And in that phrase, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. To this day, that phrase resonates when anybody talks about any trial, about any defence, about uh, many matters legal. An iconic phrase from an iconic trial, the trial of the century. James, I was listening to, to Alan Dershowitz, one of uh, O.J.'s law, O.J. Simpson's lawyers, just a little bit earlier on today, and, 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 and as he reminded me, I mean, one of the reasons that moment was was so pivotal to the trial was before that, before even we saw that that bloody glove and O.J. struggling to put it on his hand, there had been accusations and, and indeed evidence that police had had tampered with evidence, which once again played into this narrative that that, that black Americans, that African Americans as they know them there, were, were second-class citizens, that the police did not treat them fairly and ultimately the jury despite some some pretty overwhelming circumstantial evidence latched on to that moment and they acquitted them it's given the racial tensions the racial divide particularly in los angeles at that time in the context of the rodney king beating the riots the ongoing accusations of police malpractice and racism within that context there was this accusation from the defence, that police had tampered uh, with key evidence. And we looked at the, the bloody glove that didn't fit O.J. Simpson. Something else that Alan Dershowitz had to say was that jury selection for them was critical, given the racial context and the prosecution of a black man. It was a predominantly black jury, and uh, there were black women selected on that jury. The prosecution view had been, according to Dershowitz, that they wanted... They were fine with black women on the jury because they were women first, black second. That was the prosecution view. The defence saw it as the flip side. They saw them as black first and women second. He said that was a key element of their defence. They saw that as playing into the, the racial undertones that permeate, permeated throughout the trial, inside the courtroom and outside as well. And that element of race and O.J. Simpson's ethnicity played very much into the defence case and was central to much of what went on inside that courtroom. Welcome back to the Sky News Daily, where we are continuing uh, to report on the death at 76 of O.J. Simpson. Our US correspondent, James Matthews, has been has been filling in a, a lot of the gaps that exist in my memory. But because, James, of course, we, we all tend to focus on the fact that OJ was acquitted uh, of those, those twin killings. But that was not his last brush with the law. There was a civil case that was brought in, in which ultimately, you explain it to me, but, but ultimately he ha he, the court deci decided that he did have responsibility, but just not criminal responsibility. Explain. It was a, a civil suit brought by... The, the families of the two who died, uh, Ron Goldman, his family sought damages for wrongful death and battery. In the case of Nicole Brown Simpson, that was for battery alone. They didn't bring uh, a wrongful death suit, but although clearly their accusation uh, was that he was responsible for the deaths of both. There is a lower standard of proof in a civil court. Criminally, he would have to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, in a civil court, it's what we would call on the balance of probabilities. Was he more likely to be responsible for the deaths of these people than he was not? And that civil court found that yes, uh, he was, and he was sued for damages successfully, more than $38 million for both families. Um, that prompted O.J. Simpson to move to Florida. In Florida, there is a greater protection for debtors uh, who are being pursued for their assets. Although that wasn't the last time that he would have seen uh, court action or court legal pursuit of him because there came a point uh, in 2008 when he, along with others, armed with weapons, uh, entered into a Las Vegas hotel room. He was looking for memorabilia that he believed was owned or owed to him. And he took that memorabilia and he was found guilty of armed robbery, the people he was with, they uh, reached a, pre, a plea deal, testified against O.J. Simpson, and he was sent to jail. He served nine years, being released in 2017, seven years before he would ultimately die. So ultimately, justice of a sort 
did catch up with O.J. Simpson, although uh, for many, not the kind of justice that he deserved. What did O.J. Simpson do with those remaining years? I suspect contrition was not a big part of it. No, he, he never did admit to the double murder that so many thought he was guilty of. I mean, he, he lived out a, a relatively quiet life. He was a keen golfer uh, as much as his health and mobility would allow. In terms of a public profile, that was limited, certainly latterly, to uh, social media largely, commenting on matters, sporting, political, and so on. I mean, a recent video... Uh, related to reports that he was in a hospice. He published a video of him sitting in a car, uh, speaking out the window, saying, look, don't believe everything you read in the media. Hospice, he said, uh, not for him. And he denied the fact that that was where uh, he was located at that particular point. So he wasn't the OJ of old, grey of hair, um, thickened by the years, not the sporting superstar with which everybody was so familiar, living out a quiet life in his twilight years. But even before that, that, that last conviction, you know, O.J. Simpson wrote a book called If I Did It, in which he, he set out how he would have carried out the killings had he ultimately been, been the one responsible. I just, I just wonder, though, over the years, because it was, and it was something that was known at the time, you know, this was a man who was a domestic abuser. He was, you know, a, a man who was known to have a short temper. He was a man who, in his professional footballing life, as, as much as outside of it, was known to be, on occasion, prone to violence. That, that acquittal, which divided America down racial lines back at the point at which it was, it was handed down by the jury. My recollection is that, that over the years, with the civil suit and, of course, with the, with the later criminal conviction, you know, the, the, the sheen came off that acquittal, that people were doubting uh, the veracity of the jury's decision. And, and people really did start to question it, didn't they? Uh, they did, and I think understandably so, because you have an individual who uh, has lost his ex-wife, the mother of his uh, children, demonstrating not sorrow, not regret publicly, not living a quiet life with and showing due respect to her memory and to her family, a family who always believe that he killed her, but rather uh, his public persona was one of the entertainer, the, the egotist. To that extent, he was seen to insult the memory of uh, the two people who died, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Indeed, his, the father of Ron Goldman has reacted to O.J. Simpson's death, saying it's no great loss. So in terms of the memory of the people who died, respect for their bereaved families, uh, O.J. Simpson's public persona didn't quite chime with what the public might have expected. He wrote a book, If I Did It, almost, almost gloating uh, following his acquittal. He appeared on television uh, with Ruby Wax at one point, uh, and there was a scene I remember in that programme. Late at night, he'd knocked on her door, surprised her. She opened the door and he had a banana uh, almost you know, in his hand, and he made a stabbing motion towards her. So to O.J. Simpson, it all seemed like a big laugh, entertainment, the death of his ex-wife and her partner. Uh, and that uh, didn't quite chime with the public view of events and his involvement in those events. And, and also, James, as, as with so much in terms of the, the, the United States history of, of racial politics, the, the, just, it just strikes me that there are, there are so many parallels between the time at which O.J. Simpson was acquitted uh, and the period that we're living through right now. Uh, you think, of course, of, of the LAPD beating up Rodney King. You fast forward to today and, and, and George Floyd losing his life. You, you think about the way in which uh, black Americans feel that they are, to an extent, subjugated by the police force there. And that was certainly something that was a matter at the trial. I mean, in terms of the United States' uncomfortable relationship with its slavery past and, and the racial politics that emerged from, from the abolition and, and, and the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. I mean, 
Is the United States really, James, that much further forward than where it was uh, when, when O.J. Simpson was accused of these crimes? I think it's moments like the O.J. Simpson trial, the Rodney King beating, George Floyd, as you say, inflection points, moments when America's problems with racism and its culture around racism in society is laid bare. As hard as America tries to, uh, to heal the divide and to cross the racial divide and to walk in a straight line, no matter the ethnicity of its population, it is at these moments that America is tested and America can calibrate where it stands with a view to racial division. For so long, O.J. Simpson did transcend uh, racism because he was uh, a sporting superstar that America enjoyed and America celebrated. It, it was no matter uh, what colour he was for many people because they enjoyed his achievement and shared in that. They had a passion for sport. They had a passion for the movies. They had a passion for celebrity. And O.G. Simpson represented all of those things. It was when he was arrested. It was when he was put on trial. It was when he was accused of a very gruesome murder, a darkness laid bare throughout that, that murder trial that America reassessed. America could no longer escape its own reality. And the reality that this was an Af a man of African-American background being accused of the murder of two white people, a white woman in Los Angeles at that time. That's why race became a key element to his trial. And it became a key element to his trial because race was a key element in America's society at that time. And I think subsequently we learn uh, through George Floyd and events like that, uh, that race remains. Uh, a divisive issue in American culture. James, many thanks indeed. For those who don't remember it from the time, it's difficult to describe just how much of a global moment the trial of O.J. Simpson became. Framed by racial tensions, viewed through the prism of the treatment of black Americans at the hands of the police, it was always about more than Simpson's guilt or innocence. Yet over the years that followed, this hero's halo became ever more tarnished. Any legacy he had went the way of the charm and charisma which once defined him. Yet he will not be forgotten, but neither will many mourn his passing. That's your lot for this edition of The Daily. We'll see you again soon.